Hi, my name is Cody F. Meller, and I'm an artist. I want to talk to you a little bit about my artwork and kind of what I'm thinking just in terms of um, what's going on behind the painting um, also. Um, so I'm a mixed media artist. I work with a lot of cut paper and paint, a lot of collage, and just different types of things I like to find. Um, I particularly like working with this process because it's a, um, well, first off, it, it's an element that goes a little bit better than my original intention because I'm an illustrator by trade, so I will, you know, I will, I will work with um, drawing out an image and, and kind of placing it all out. But then I find these pieces of cut paper that are much better than my original intention. And I love that. I love that little element of surprise. I also love um, like the constant hunt for these things. So like what I mean things like the, the resources, like, you know, I have old second grade readers from the 1880s sitting at home ready to be used. I have, you know, old pictures of carousel horses. I have, you know, odd shapes and patterns and I'm always looking and I love that hunt. I love always looking. Um, so that's, that's, and I also kind of love when I'm doing that, this, this, this kind of chain reaction, okay, because I have this kind of, it's kind of like you know Frodo on his journey where he has just enough of the map for the next part of the journey where I have it kind of laid out, but I, but from there it's just a chain reaction. I'll lay something down like I might lay down this 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 bark pattern here, and then I lay this down next to that just to see how it looks, and it's just this chain reaction. From that chain reaction, it goes out from here. So overall, I have an idea what it's going to be, but I don't want to control it too much. And I, I love that process in making art because <laughs> that's life. <laughs> you know, this is this this thing of um, we have this general idea, of, you know, of how we want our life to look, and we work towards that. But there's no guarantees. This particular image is called God's Rebels, and it's um, it's about the Hebrew midwives. Um, and there was two of them. I put three in just because if I wanted to. But there's it's just two in scripture. And, I particularly love the story for a number of reasons. The, the first one is, is um, if you look through scripture, and actually if you look through history, just in general, and you actually, even, even personal, if you just look at your own life, um, usually the people that, um, that stand out to us most in our lives, or are most important in our lives, are the very quiet, unassuming, under the radar type of people. I like the I like just the kind of the playoff of um, um, these kind of small elements of surprising images in terms of some things are actual photographs and some things are are textures and patterns of things behind that and I then I make the face and kind of put those things next to each other. Um, I like also putting things small things inside there that seem to be out of context or they don't seem to be there. Um, mostly because in some ways I just feel like they need to be there. Well, I guess a lot of it has to do also just with how I see life, how I read the scripture, how I understand grace. And um, some things seem very clear and realistic to me and some things just don't add up. And I think what the Hebrew midwives kind of say very clearly is that God's promise is even more, um, even more real and even more power than our perception. When I when I when I created that painting, I was a young young father, and um, you know just the whole idea of um, being in a position like that was unconceivable to me. And actually, you know, like parents are in that position on a daily basis around the world all the time, and it just I can't quite grasp it. Um, the whole idea that um, the best option that she had was putting her child in a river. Putting that child in a river and hoping the best. Like, okay, I don't want the alligators or alligators to get him or whatever. I don't want, you know, all these kind of prayers. This is the best thing you can do. And, um, and I guess many, many years after the fact of making that painting, it resonates with me even more as I'm older and my boys are 
get ready to graduate from high school and stuff like that. And I think about there are so many things in life where it's like, dear Lord, I just have to trust you. And this is the this is the best bad decision that I can work with right now. And I just have to go forward and just need you to trust me. I need you to make something beautiful out of this because it's, I'm way over my head in this. I am, I have hit a brick wall. I can't do it. I can't, you must. But the most, the biggest thing I did with the, just kind of the resurrection is these butterflies behind her. Um, and that kind of goes back to what I said earlier about, um, for me, I have to have this kind of white knuckled grip on God's promises, even when everything around me does not make sense. So like when, it's kind of funny, like over the last three years or so, um, you know, I serve at food pantry at our church and we go there you know, every other week or when we can, at least, at least two or three times a month. And when we carry out groceries for people and we pray for individuals and we start hearing their stories, and, and it's just like, there's so many people that have this kind of white knuckle grip on God's grace and goodness. You know, I talked to one woman a month ago, and I was like, how can I pray for you? She said, my whole family died of the Ebola breakout. Can you pray for me? And it's like, you know, people housing other homeless families, but they're figuring out they're selling crack, crack and meth out of their house, and what do they do, you know? And, um, you know, it's like, but they're wanting prayer. And at the same time, they're saying that it's so powerful for me because they're basically saying, you know, um, I'm gonna, I'm holding on to God's promise. I'm holding on to what God says about Himself, and that He really does love me. He's not gonna leave me or forsake me. And I believe it's true. I believe in Exodus 14, 14, He says He's gonna. I need to still. And he's gonna fight for me. He's actually gonna fight for me. Um, so the the butterflies in the back. It's like that's the reality. That's the reality that, that God is working for her good. Every ounce of her body is saying, don't do this. But she does it. And, um, you know, the end result is not only she gets her child back, she gets paid to take care of her child um, through um, um, Pharaoh's daughter. In the, in the painting, that you, you see it, a lot of this manna coming down and it, um, it's when it kind of first happens. Because the way that the, the women are looking, um, they're surprised by it and they're they're happy. Uh, and then there's a little bit of it kind of integrating to the, this little girl in the foreground. When, when we pray about something, when we pray about something for a really long time, and sometimes God answers us in a very clear, direct way, and it kind of right is in line with um, what we were thinking. It's like, thank you, Lord. And then there's sometimes when God will answer us in a way that makes absolutely no sense to us, but if you really squint your eyes, that's, you know, he's answering. It might be through a person that you might not even like that much. But God's speaking through that person to you, or he's, he's giving you this thing that you need, but um, it's not really what you prayed for or what you thought. It's almost like God hears the prayers underneath your prayers, knows the prayers he answers, you know. Um, so when this, when this, um, Man it starts kind of subtly kind of going to the girl's um, dress. It's kind of just um, a way of talking about like when we when we can ask God to say, "Hey, Lord, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear what you're saying." And Lord, I want to serve you on your terms. Okay, I don't want to worship the God of my understanding. You know, I don't I don't want to worship this comfortable God that I've made up, um, this country club God. I want I want to spend my life well. I want to be comfortable, be made uncomfortable. So however you answer me, help me to be receptive of that. And in that sense, like the manna, whatever that manna would be, starts to really shape and mold you and make you into this person you could have never ever thought you would have been before. Um, so I, I think about the transition of manna, like the literal manna to, as I said before, these things that I'm um, that happens to our life in terms of how God brings manna into our lives, and it could be in some really profound way. Um, you know, like you you need five thousand dollars or whatever, and you pray for it, and some kind of odd set of circumstances you get it. Or it could be in some way that you're walking down the street and somebody 
says hi to you or says some little phrase to you and it was a phrase that your grandma used to say when you were three years old or five years old and she said it in that same tone and it's exactly what you need to hear at that time and it was like manna from heaven you know i think of really extreme things like i read stories of like that um one with uh, the truth and reconciliation commission that was started by nelson mandela and uh, desmond tutu um, and breaking down the apartheid, uh, dealing with apartheid. And Desmond Tutu said the country needed healing more than needed justice. And one of the stories is like this man had killed both of this woman's husband and her child. One he shot and one he set on fire. And then the judge says to the woman, he's like, you know, is there any request you have of this? I think his name's Van Brock. Do you have any requests of him? You know, and that old woman looks at him and she's like. You know, I'm still an old woman. I still have a lot of love to give. But under a court mandate, I want Mr. Van Brock to come to the ghettos for three hours a month, and I want to love him and be a, a mother. And someone in the back of the court starts singing Amazing Grace, and then the whole courtroom starts singing Amazing Grace. And and this, this Van Brock didn't even hear it. He fainted. It was too much for him, you know? <laughs> it's like... You know, it's like all those things I see is like, you know, like as, as a Christian, at some point when I was in Romania doing short term mission and I, and I listened to a guy named Richard Warrenbrand speak and, and it was in this culture house and all these people, he had been tortured for 14 years, seven years in the Nazis, seven years in the communists. And most of the people in this room had been tortured under the dictator Ceausescu. And I thought it was going to be really somber, but they were laughing. There was great laughter and great joy. And at that moment, at the moment as a young Christian, I said to myself, there's no way in hell this can be just behavioral modification. There is something in the very nucleus in the heart of us that's been changed. And it's like, there's so much manna going on. that God throws these things at you and it's like, just help me to listen, help me to see it. And um, help me to have my hands open. I believe God often speaks and works in our lives in, in ways that we don't understand. It doesn't mean that we're not, that God isn't loving us and, and working in our lives. We just don't understand it. It's like, it's a, it's a language that is hard to understand. The hands are just a way of like, something like, I understand like some basic language, but for the most part, like, I'm clueless to it. The hand over top is, um, there's a scripture, I've already forgotten where it is, but it talks about um, God protecting you with the shadow of his hand. Henry Now, in a number of his books, there's a certain theme that comes up in a number of his books where he talks about, we have, in this journey, we have these closed fists, and it's so hard to open them. And, and often, sometimes when we open them, we see there's like another closed fist inside that one. When you have to make a decision where you put your life on the line, you've made a thousand decisions before that, a thousand mini, small little decisions before that, to be able to to open your hands to make that decision in that moment. So I'm always kind of amazed when I hear about somebody putting their life on the line to you know, jump in a freezing river to save someone. I'm most amazed about that, not that they did it, but of the thousands of little mini decisions that they made um, self, of self-sacrifice, of putting someone, above, someone else's needs above their own to come to that decision. And that's kind of like why I made their hands a little bit bigger in my Thank mm -hmm. you.